We are talking about two kings, but primarily we're talking about stopping of Christmas. In our society today, we know that major scenes are being taken down. Throughout our corporate world, it's no longer Merry Christmas, but it's Happy Holidays. My friends, we know because of us being believers and understand that he is the reason for the season, that sometimes it can really frustrate us when this happens. I'm reminded of a story that I think I shared with you guys quite some time back. There was a gentleman that was flying overseas and flying back and he bought some cheese and he wanted to bring it back with him and when he got to uh, the security on the on the plane they unwrapped what it was as cheese and the guy said you can't take that with you it's against the law to take that cheese with you uh, this missionary said I'm I'm taking my cheese with me said, sir, no, you're not. You cannot take that in. It's not allowed. He said, I'm taking my cheese. The man said, listen, you either throw it away or I will take it from you. The guy, once again, politely said, sir, I'm taking my cheese. He got out of line, went over on the side, and started eating his cheese. <laughs> Came back in line, passed the gentleman, said, Sir, I'm taking my cheese with you. <laughs> Friends, they may tell us that they, they, we cannot have manger scenes. They may tell us in the corporate world, you don't say Merry Christmas, you say Happy Holidays. But friends, let me tell you this. Because Jesus, if you're a child of God here today, Jesus lives within you. Amen? Amen. Hasn't he radically changed your life? Yes. I mean, I'm not talking about, oh, yeah, it's a little bit different now. I think it's a little bit better. Man, he has just radically changed my life. Where there was no hope, now there's hope. Where there's uncertainty, now there's certainty. Not that every question gets answered, but I know who's in control. And that's awesome. And I know I'm in the midst of people like that, but my friends, listen, when Jesus is in you, no matter what they say, no matter who says, you cannot bring Jesus in here, you can't take Jesus to your workplace, you can't take Jesus to your office, you can't take it here, you can't take it there, you can tell them, I'm taking him with me. Because wherever I am, there he is. Amen? Amen. That's pretty awesome. That'll rock your world. Well, I don't think we need to take up another offering. That's pretty good stuff right there. I'm not going to charge you for it, but that was good stuff. Wherever I'm at, because Jesus is within me, Jesus is going. I can't help it. It just overflows. I can't keep my mouth shut. That's a good thing. And sometimes, even when you can't say those words, God has the ability to the Holy Spirit in a workplace or wherever it may be, maybe even in homes. There are some places in homes where God's not really allowed. But let me tell you, God will shine through. If you're a child of God, people's going to say, there's something about it. There's something about that individual. Don't you love it when somebody says that to you? Oh, there's something about you. Or when they say, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. This morning, I didn't come here to tell you that, but anyway, that's what the Holy Spirit said. So we'll give it to you. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Harold, Herod, I'm sorry, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Father God, you are awesome. And yes, Lord God, wherever we go, Jesus is there. 
Because you promised that you come into our life. You filled our life, Lord. It's not our lives anymore. It's yours. We're living for your cause. For you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Father God, this morning as we look at the Magi, oh, maybe a little different, Lord, as we look at the Magi even before what we consider Christmas Day. Lord, it's such a strong message, strong lesson here. So, Father, I pray more than anything else. I pray that I may decrease, that you may increase. People need to hear from you today, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, people try to stop Christmas. Scrooge is one. How about the Grinch? I think the thing I remember most about the Grinch is, I think it's the Grinch, isn't that where they, that poor dog gets horns duct taped to it? That's <laughs> That's, that's probably my favorite. Now these are these are fictitious people that have tried to stop Christmas. But this morning we're going to look at the one that truly tried to stop Christmas. None other than Herod the Great. That's what they called him, Herod the Great. Uh, perhaps we would not refer to him as that. He came from a strong political family. It was in his blood, if you will. He was the governor of Galilee at age 25, which was sort of unheard of, young age. In 40 B.C., he was proclaimed, now listen to this, because this will be very important as we unfold these scriptures. He, in 40 B.C., he was claimed or called the king of the Jews. He was a power man. And if anything got in his way, he was going to take care of that issue. It is said that he killed his brother-in-law. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed some of his, his wives. In fact, it is said that the wife he loved the most, he ended up killing. Someone said, I would rather be, uh, I would rather be a pig in King Harold's uh, King Eric's kingdom to be, to be one of his family members. Three sons were killed. In fact, five days or thereabouts <coughs> before Herod died, he had one of his kings, one of his sons killed. When he was nearing the end of his life, he realized that the community would not mourn his loss. So he decided that he would take some prominent men, gather them together, sort of hold them hostage, and the, the, the rule that he put down was this. On the day that he died, all his prominent men were to be killed. Because he knew that the, the, uh, the area would not mourn his death, but they would mourn the death of those prominent men, at least they would be mourning at his death. That was the kind of mind that he had. King Herod. In Matthew chapter 2, we're running into the last month of his life. We know that Herod had some kind of disease. It's, it's debatable, and, and when, when you look at Josephus, a, a, a historian, it's debatable what kind of disease he said, but it said that in, in his closing week or two that he could be heard yelling at night because of the intense pain that he was in. We already know, even earlier in his life, even before this, this man was not really right. If you got in his way, he killed you. And he did it to his own family. But we pick up now in the final months of Herod's life. And this is when the other king, we have King Herod, but the other king, the King Jesus, is coming on the scene. Picking up in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, 
Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We have saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Magi comes and they <laughs> say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? of the Jews. Do you think they got Herod's attention? You bet it did. Herod saying, I'm king of the Jews. Now this word coming from the Magi that is coming in saying, where is the one who has been born? King of the Jews. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now it says this, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. He was disturbed. Some translation says trouble. It means, that word trouble means violently shaken. Harold was all, Herod, Harold. Uh, that, that's his other brother. No, I'm just kidding. No. Uh, Herod, King Herod, was visibly upset with this. He was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When I was out shopping with my wife, you know, it, it really supposed to be a happy, joyous time, doesn't it? And parents bring the kids and the kids are all smiling and usually by Towards the evening, they have enough sugar in them that they're pretty much wound up for the rest of the day. And sometimes you can see them coming in and, and moms and dads are saying, and, and one of them was there saying, what do you want for Christmas? And they were all smiles and kidding around. And then a little bit later, it gets a little more intense. As you have to buy those gifts, right? You have to buy them for everybody. And if somebody buys something for you, well, you got to buy it for them. And if they're going to pay $5, do I need to pay $5? Is it $10? How much is the gifts going to be this year? Do you know what they're getting? Do you know this? Ever been down there? Now, one good thing about being married most time for men, we don't really know what gifts we got, right? We're as surprised as the people when they unwrap them. It's a surprise for us. But you see mother going, come on, i got to get stuff for Christmas. Let's go. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> wonderful time. <laughs> Here it says that Herod was not happy. And all around him were not happy. When Herod was unhappy, everybody else was unhappy because they knew somebody would be killed in this deal. So we have an unhappy Herod. And in verse 4, this is what Herod decides. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of law, he asked them, where the Christ was to be born. These were the religious leaders. These people knew the word of God. And Herod calls them in and says, where is he supposed to be born? He goes back to Micah, and they quote Micah here, and says, in Bethlehem in Judea, they reply, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means less among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Another key word here, verse 6, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means less among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler. Come a ruler. Remember Herod's mentality. Nobody's going to get in my way. Nobody's going to stop me. And they said a ruler is coming. They've already called him the king of the Jews. Now they say he's going to be a ruler. We know that Herod is certainly 
ready to do some bad things. Verse 7, Then the Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, there's a few myths about the Magi. We don't really know how many there are. We say that there's three because three gifts. But there could have been more than three. We don't know. You don't have to go back and change your uh, major scene by, by more wise men, Magi. But we really don't know if there were, in fact, three or not. They probably did not ride in on camels, and they probably had an entourage of people with them. Probably rode in on horses of stallions. And though this may not be that awful important, uh, <coughs> we really don't know, but we suspect that they certainly did not run, run in on, uh, ride in on camels. Magi were actually magicians. They're the study of mystical things. The study of mystical things. They were great astronomers, math people. They also, and, and I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings, but they were not at the stable. We always do that. We always put them at the stable, but they were not at the stable. We see here in verses 9 through 12, um, after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped at the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. This word child primarily means toddler, so uh, it, it could mean a child probably four months to two years of age. So they also did not come to the manger. Now they brought gifts. And this is not going to cost you a thing. It's just a little something extra. They were unwrapped. There's two reasons. They were wise, and second, they were men. <laughs> men don't wrap gifts, right? Men just don't wrap. Well, let's... No, I'm sorry. I, I got wrapped. But anyway. So they brought gifts. Okay. Let's look at this. We want to look at the primary characters that took place during this time and their reaction to the other king. Verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, and go back to verse 12 to get that, and having been warned in a dream, speaking of the Magi, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another round. Now one of my first thoughts here is this. They came to the Magi in a dream. But the Magi came and was in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I know guys, we talk about this all the time, but it's so vitally important. They had a personal a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. They saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it says here in verse 12, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. Listen, my friends, if you're here today and you have had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have had contact with Jesus, in a personal, powerful way, you never go back the way you came. Isn't that true? Amen. Oh my goodness. I just, man, when I think about it, and I'll tell you, this is one of the parts as, as, a, as a preacher and as a teacher, I have issues with because I just can't get the right words. You ever said something to somebody and said, did you get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? And I think you'll get it. I just don't know if I'll get the right words. That the life before that personal encounter with Jesus Christ, I pray and I know I'll never have to go back there. 
Well, let me tell you one of the saddest things. It's when you have seen others that has that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. And it can be somebody very close to you. And you can see a radical change in their life. And things happen in their life. And, and they turn to Jesus Christ. You know, things used to happen in my life, man, I just, I'd try to figure out a way. Have you ever done that? Try to figure out a way how to fix it. Praise be unto God. After the first relationship with Jesus Christ, things come into your life and just go to Jesus in prayer. Say, God, take control of my life. But it's sad when someone else just sees that happening in your life. They see it in a co-worker, maybe a friend, maybe even a family member. I had one gentleman that I worked with for years. In fact, I was in business with him. And his closing words at the close of our business was this. I don't know what you have, but I sure would like to have it. See, him and his wife had split up. But listen, folks, I understand there's reasons behind everything. Jesus was never in his life. And every time I wanted to tell him about the babe, he changed the subject. You ever had somebody do that? Have you done that? But my friends, Jesus changes lives. And when I see this of the Magi, I know it was in a dream. They told me to go in a different way. But when you truly have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will never go back to where you came from. And that's awesome. It just changes your life. Some of the characters here. One is Herod. Let me go on and read here, picking up in verse 16 again. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. Oh, can you imagine Harry get curious? That would been quite a scene. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem. Some have referred to Herod as the butcher of Bethlehem. I know that's not a good, a good term. And its vicinity who were two years old and under. In accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because there are no more. As we look at this character, as we look at Herod, and I don't think anybody in here is murdered or anything like that. My friends, Herod cared about one single thing, and that was Herod. Nothing else mattered to him. Remember when I talked about that, that life before? Maybe you can go back and say, you know, I wasn't a Herod. Nobody would admit to that. But I was all about me. Isn't it a blessing? Now tell me this. Isn't it a blessing when Jesus changes that, when you say, you know what? It's more about others than it is about me. Isn't that pretty awesome? And watch this. Won't Jesus then lead people into your lives that you can help out and change their lives? That's pretty awesome. He couldn't lead them into you before because you weren't ready. Herod cared about only about Herod. And some of the most miserable people at Christmas. I remember shopping for my two boys. I, I love, I tell you one thing I do miss about Christmas is shopping for my sons. Oh, I was so much fun. But they'd have that stuff open in 15 minutes. <laughs> in one month, most of it was history then. Wasn't that important? But those that are all about self, 
Christmas can be a very challenging time. Listen to what Herod said here. I know we got to close. Listen to what Herod said. <coughs> Verse 8, he sent them, the Magi, to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. No way he wanted to worship because it stood in his way. He was all about self. Number two, there's a chief priest and the scribes. They knew scripture. They knew it. I, folks, I know the Christmas story. I know the Christmas scripture. I've been preaching it, seemed like since I was knee high to the duck. Now since I'm 28, and I, I haven't been preaching quite as long. But, but I know it. Inside out. You know it too, right? Man, I've heard this. I've heard about the Magi. I've heard about this and the message next week. You're going to say that's a familiar passage. But the scribes knew it here, but it didn't get here. And when it gets here, you say, ah, that's the story of my Savior coming that died for me on the cross. I will live forever with him. He's the one that even, even when I let him down, his love, his mercy and grace never stops. Tell me the story one more time. Tell me about him coming. Tell me about his love. Tell me about his compassion. Tell me about his grace. Continue to tell me the story. The scribes, they knew it here but didn't know it here. What a difference it makes when you have it here. I tell you what, that's not a Sunday morning thing, right? That's a 724 when you have it here. It just changes everything in your life. Again, you can't help it. You, you ate the cheese. <laughs> You got Jesus in your life. It just rat doesn't doesn't it rat? Remember they say the sounds trying to go with the words you might think once say, oh hold on, and here's the words you're looking for. When you have him in you, it changes everything around you. Doesn't it? Oh man, that's awesome. I preach. Okay, the last one. The last two, the wise men. Remember they study mystical things? Maybe some of the occult? But look what they did here. Watch this thing. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped. Oh, folks, if nothing else this Christmas, worship and praise the Almighty God. Listen to some of those Christmas carols. Listen to some of that music and just praise and worship Him for who He is and what He has done. Watch this thing. For what He has done for you. And let me tell you, there'll be somebody that God will lead into your life that you need to tell them this holiday season what He's done. The last one is the son. And we'll, we'll look, I don't want to say we'll look more now. It sounds like I'm leaving Jesus out. No, he's the reason for the season. He's the most important part. This Christmas, take Jesus with you in all of it. Share with others what Jesus has done. You have him in you. No matter where you go, it's going to be a part of who you are. I want to close with this illustration. There was a father had a son, and they were wealthy. And one of the favorite things the father and son enjoyed doing was going to buy art. Uh, and they bought some very expensive pieces of art. Well, war broke out, and this man's son went out to serve his country. Several months down the road, he got that notification that his son had died in battle. He was devastated because of the relationship that he had had with his son. He looked at the art and it just didn't seem to mean a whole lot. It was a couple weeks later someone came and knocked on his door and he opened it up and he said 
I know you don't know who I am. But I was a soldier with your son. And I was with him the day that he passed away. The day he was killed. He said, I want to give you this picture. I do a little art. And I drew a picture of your son a couple months before this. And I didn't know. I thought maybe you would like to have it. So he took that picture and removed probably the most expensive painting he had in his house and put it up. It wasn't, it wasn't done that well. But it was done well enough that he could see his son. He could see his eyes. And he sees the essence of who he is. It wasn't too much longer and the father passed away. And just as he put in the wheel, there was a big auction for all of that fine work of art. And people came from all over. There were literally, literally millions of dollars of artwork that was getting ready to be sold at the end. <coughs> the auctioneer was there, and when he got there, the very first picture that came up was the sun. The guy said, we'll start the bidding at $100. One person said, we're not here for that. We didn't come here to buy a picture of this man's son. We came here for all of the valuable artwork that's here. The auctioneer said, I'm doing it just as the man requested. The first picture up for auction is his son. Well, a next door neighbor, sort of to the side because <coughs> he in no way could purchase all that, said, I'll give you $50 for he knew the son and the father. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice, all fair and final offers, sold. Sold at $50. The auctioneer then said, the auction is over. And the people that were there said, hold on a second. What about all these millions of dollars of artwork? He said, the man said this, whoever chose the son gets it. Whoever chose the son gets it. Folks, one thing we learn at Christmas is what's the problem? If you have the son, I encourage you to continue on. Be sold out to Jesus this Christmas season. For if you have the Son, you have the Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for today. Father God, you are so awesome. Lord, I just thank you for your word that just changes lives. Well, Father, sometimes when I talk, I would be far wiser just to open up your word because that's the power, that's the strength. The Lord, this day, if there's anyone here that is not fully holding on to you, Lord, they may be saved. They've given their life to you. But they've fallen in some of the ways of hair, doing their own thing. What's important with them becomes more of a priority than what's important for you. Oh, Father God, just like the Magi, they can say, I'm just going to worship the King. I'm coming to Him this morning. Father, I'll be at the front to entertain any decisions that anyone may have. Some may want to pray right where they are while the song's going on. Others may want to come up and take my hand and pray. For the Father God, I pray that we'll do as the Holy Spirit leads us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close this morning.